Hi, my name is Al, and today we're going to be identifying one of my favorite D&D subclasses, the Hexblade Warlock. Okay, so I know the Hexblade Warlock has been out for a while, but it is one of my absolute favorite subclasses in Dungeons & Dragons. There is a lot to talk about here, from the awesome flavor that it offers, as well as the a bit overpowered nature of the subclass. So what I'm going to do here today is I'm going to go through all of the subclasses for the Hexblade Warlock and give my opinions on them as someone who has not only played it multiple times as a player, but has also run for a Hexblade Warlock as a DM. So let's jump right into what are these Hexblade Warlocks about? Well, their patrons are entities from the Shadowfell that manifest in the form of sentient blades. In the book, there is also talk about the Raven Queen and her hand in the creation of these sentient weapons and how she uses them as tools to further her goals. And right off the bat, can we talk about how cool that flavor is? I am just imagining this order of warlocks who carry around these obsidian black blades and have their own agenda who serve the Raven Queen or some other entity from the Shadowfell. It's an incredibly cool flavor, if not just a little bit edgy. So let's jump right into the features here. At first level, when you pick your patron, you get an expanded warlock spell list, which include the following spells. At first level spell slots, you have Shield and Wrathful Smite. Second level, Blur and Branding Smite. Third level, Blink and Elemental Weapon. Fourth level, Phantasmal Killer and Staggering Smite. Fifth level, Brandishing Smite and Cone of Cold. It's obvious that this subclass is all about the Gish spell sword fantasy, and Brandishing Smite and the other smites are perfect for fulfilling that fantasy. Though I do wish there was a little bit more utility on this list, taking up so many of these spells really sucks, especially since you're probably going to be taking the Invocation, which is Eldridge Smite, at later levels, it feels like a little bit of a waste having these added spells, though I understand why they're here. Also, at first level spell slots, you have shield, which is really great at first level. However, every spell slot level that you increase as a warlock, casting shield is just going to feel worse and worse, because shield is one of those spells that doesn't get better as you upcast it. So if you have 5th level spell slots as a warlock, then it's going to feel really bad if you waste one of them on a shield, which is a 1st level spell for everybody else. At 1st level, you also get Hexblade's Curse. As a bonus action, you can curse a creature that is within 30 feet of you for 1 minute. Though the curse ends early, if you die, the creature dies, or you are incapacitated. While the creature is cursed, you gain the following benefits. First, you get a bonus to your damage rolls equal to your proficiency bonus. Additionally, any attack you make against the cursed target hits a critical on a 19 or a 20 roll of the die. Additionally, when the cursed target dies, you gain a number of hit points equal to your warlock level, plus your Charisma modifier. Once you use this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a short or a long rest. So this ability is actually really good. And even though the Hexblade is a Gish-focused class, it doesn't have anything as part of this ability that requires you to make a melee attack. Sure, you're getting more hit points, that critical threat range is really great, especially when you get those Eldritch Smites later, 
and you are also dealing extra damage with your proficiency bonus, which makes you a little bit more viable in the mid to front lines, but these all work with Eldritch Blast or another damaging spell or cantrip that you may be casting that has an attack roll and deals damage. Seeing this ability in practice, it is almost always best to use for the biggest thing in the room. Remember, you only get one of these per short rest until way later in the subclass, so you really don't want to waste it. You really want to make sure that it counts, so you're going to have to gun it for the big bad, the thing with the most hit points, to ensure that you're not just cursing a goblin and then slapping them down and feeling bad that you just lost your curse ability. The only exception that I could see to this is maybe if you are really low on hit points and you haven't used your curse yet and you're really trying to get that extra little bit of hit points, then I could totally see you picking the smallest thing in the room and then hoping to kill it so you can absorb its energy and keep on fighting. Additionally, as you can see, these benefits are really good for anybody. I think any class that is dealing damage and making attacks is going to really like these benefits, which makes the Hexblade already a pretty good first level dip. But it doesn't stop there at first level. You also get Hex Warrior. The first part of this feature allows you to get proficiency in medium armor, shields, and martial weapons. Additionally, when you finish a long rest, you can touch one weapon that lacks the two-handed property. When you do so, you can start using your charisma modifier for attack and damage rolls instead of your strength or dexterity modifier. It's also important to note, if you later take the Pact of the Blade archetype feature, then you can channel this energy and use your charisma modifier with any weapon that you summon, regardless of if it has the two-handed property. This benefit only lasts until you finish a long rest, but at which point you could choose another weapon or re-channel the same weapon. So this feature, along with help from the Hexblade's curse, is really what solidifies the Hexblade Warlock subclass as one of, if not the best, Warlock subclass. And it's what makes it such an attractive dip. This ability is great. It makes you single ability score dependent. Now you only have to really worry about your charisma because you don't have to worry too much about dexterity. You probably want at least a 14 so you can get plus two on your medium armor, but that's all you really need to go for. And then you can pump the rest into charisma because that's your attack and your damage rolls. That's your spell save DC. It's your face abilities of persuasion and deception. It's a big part of the game and it's what makes the Hexblade Warlock so solid. Not only that, but with the cost of only one level, you could pretty much enable any charisma focused class into being a Gish or a spell sword, Having medium armor, shields, that curse ability, a first level spell slot just because you took Warlock, and then being able to have charisma be for all your attack and damage rolls is something that is insane for like a College of Swords bard, or even if you wanted to do a Gish style sorcerer. The weirdest thing about this is I find that players in my home group are often considering, if not outright, taking a dip into Hexblade, even if they aren't a Gish archetype just because they have a decent enough charisma. I mean, the absolute value you get out of a one level dip here is pretty insane. Like I said with the Hexblade's curse ability, those benefits are pretty darn good for whatever subclass you may be, especially if you have the charisma to spare. And this is the primary reason why at mine and Ben's tables, we have a little bit of a fix for the weird disparity for all these features at level one, which I'll talk about in my overall wrap up of the class. Additionally, when you take the Pact of the Blade, then you can start 
swinging around a great sword using your charisma for the attack and damage rolls, which is just a little bit silly, though I do like the flavor, and just having a great sword and not being a strength-based class is something that's pretty interesting to me. Things get even crazier if you end up taking the improved packed weapon invocation, because now it can be hand crossbows, short bows, and long bows. So now you're less of a hex blade and more of a hex bow or a bow blade. <laughs> it's a little bit silly, but it really enables a lot of stuff. Now you have this range option other than Eldritch Smite. So the next feature we're going to talk about is Accursed Spectre, which is a really interesting and a little unexpected ability for this subclass. But before we get there, I just wanted to say thank you for getting this far in the video. And if you would just leave a like or even consider subscribing, either of those would really help out the channel and what I'm doing here. All right, enough of that. The Accursed Spectre feature that you get at 6th level is really interesting. When you slay a humanoid, you can temporarily bind it to your service and have it fight on your side. It uses the specter statistics found in the monster manual. In addition, it gains a bonus to its attack and damage rolls equal to your charisma modifier. It also gets a number of temporary hit points, in addition to the hit points that it already has, equal to half of your Warlock level. Now, this specter sticks around until it falls in battle, or you finish a long rest, at which point its spirit is freed into the afterlife. Once you bind a specter with this feature, you cannot do so again until you finish a long rest. So this is where the flavor kind of takes a fork in the road. Either you're totally down with the idea of slaying a humanoid and capturing its soul to fight alongside you, or you're like, oh, well, I was really more in it for this really cool warlocky black blade sort of aesthetic. I don't really want to be trapping people's souls along with it. There's also a bit of a mechanical fork in the road because some people aren't really all that fond of tracking a whole nother stat block, especially if you're a new player, that can be very, very intimidating. However, I'm of the mind that even though it feels a little bit weird, I think the ability is cool enough in flavor and mechanics that I could really forgive it because adding a bunch of hit points on the field in the form of a specter is always good, and the specter has an ability to suck the life out of the creatures that it attacks. Having a little bit of a buff equal to your charisma modifier can really help out, and like I said, having another sack of hit points on the field is something that I can never say no to. So this is where my experience with the subclass really comes in handy, because even though it seems like you're going to get this ability off every single day, I find that's not always the case. It really depends on your games. So in a water deep dragon heist sort of game, or in a game full of cultists and spellcasters, it might be super easy to get off your specter every day and in early hours of the day. However, if you may find yourself descending into Avernus, you might be fighting a lot more fiends and demons than humanoid creatures. That's something to be on the lookout for, because I've been in plenty of games where the main theme was fighting a whole bunch of fey or undead, and it, the humanoids are few and far between. So players, if you're a Hexblade Warlock, when you get this feature, make sure your DM knows so they can throw you a bone every now and then to make sure that your 6th level ability goes off. And DMs, don't be afraid to get a little bit creative with the type of creatures you're throwing at your Hexblade Warlock. Maybe the pack of wolves that are about to attack your party features a couple of humans or goblins that have lived among the wolves for some time now and are now acting as one of the wolves. This is just one I'll be a little silly example of how you can really spice things up and throw in a couple humanoid creatures every now and then. Humanoid is definitely not the least common type, but depending on your campaign, you might see less or more of them. 
Next, at 10th level is Armor of Hexes. When the target of your Hexblade's curse attacks you, you can use your reaction to roll a d6. On a 4 or higher, the attack misses, no matter what they rolled. So this ability is really interesting. We don't see these types of roll a d6 and on a number or higher, the attack just blatantly miss, irrespective of what the enemy is doing. And we didn't see this before this subclass, and we don't see it a lot after this subclass as well. However, I think it's a very interesting ability. On a 4, 5, or 6, the creature just outright misses, which means that you have a near 50% chance, by using your reaction, of totally making the creature whiff. Not to mention, you declare this after the creature hits you. So you're not wasting it on a potential miss from the creature. The creature already hit you, but you're doing this last bit of effort to make sure the creature does not strike you. So this ability is very unique. We don't see a lot of it, but I do wish it was a little bit more inspired. The Accursed Spectre was really cool. And the Hexblade's Curse was awesome, and I like that it's synergizing with that earlier ability, but I do wish there was just a little bit more to it. Next, at 14th level, you get Master of Hexes, which means when a creature that was affected by your Hexblade's Curse dies, you can move that Hexblade's Curse to another creature that you can see within 30 feet of you. However, if you do so this way, you don't get those hit points regained, from the normal Hexblade's Curse ability. So this is the ability that I have really been waiting for. Only having one Hexblade's Curse per short rest can really feel bad, especially even if you target the big bad and your team goes full Nova and outright destroys them, it can feel like your curse was wasted. So now having this recur ability is really nice, especially if you're already at max hit points and you don't really need the hit points anyway. Now, I do understand why you don't get the hit points if you're moving the hex, because at 14th level, theoretically, if you have a 20 charisma at this point, which is very viable, you are getting, what, 19 hit points regained on a successful death from your cursed target. So being able to bop that around with minions and just gaining all this hit points would be a little bit too powerful. Though I wish you got maybe half or a quarter of the normal one, or maybe just equal to your charisma modifier, just to give it a little extra something. Because just like the 10th level ability, I don't feel like this one's as inspired. Once again, I am super happy that it synergizes with that main curse ability, though I wish there was a little bit more space for the flavor of your really cool black blade or bow or whatever it is at this point. And I know that invocations are around to deal with that. I just wish there was something a little bit more special going on. Like, can you imagine if at this level you could expend a use of your Hexblade's curse to empower yourself? That might be an interesting ability. Now, instead of hurting another target, you're emboldening yourself to be more powerful and to further augment your swordsmanship prowess. So this class is absolutely bonkers. The power that is packed into those early levels and even later levels when you start thinking about those invocations is absolutely insane. And I know these spell sword type subclasses need a little extra help with armor proficiencies and making sure that they're not too multi-ability score dependent, but the Hexblade just ramps that up a notch and makes it super useful to more than just the Warlock class. All these dips really make it a problem for the game. And I really think that even in the era of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, they are still struggling to publish Warlock subclasses that meet the power level of the Hexblade. Do I think that the Hexblade is the best subclass in the game? 
Not necessarily. There are some dedications that you really have to put into the subclass. Like you really want Thirsting Blade, an improved pack weapon, eventually you're gonna want Life Drinker, and that's really going to eat up your invocations. And that's something that's worth noting about this subclass. The further you go into being really awesome at your martial prowess, the worse you're going to be as a utility spellcaster. If you're using all your spell slots, dealing tons of damage with your Eldritch Smites, then you're not using those as utility spells with your higher level Warlock slots. Oftentimes you're also missing out on those invocations that let you cast spells at will, like Disguise Self or Silent Image. These are the trade-offs that you have to consider when you're building a Hexblade. Are you going to really go into being really awesome at the martial ability? Or are you going to really go and lean into some of that more versatility that spellcasting classes offer? And that's why I think it's a really, really good spell sword, if not the best, because you really get to adjust those sliders to your need. What do I like as a player? Do I like to be a little bit more martial focused or a little bit more spellcasting focused? With the Hexblade, you have that option. Though you do have to buy into the flavor a little bit, especially with that Accursed Spectre. So if you're like me and you really hate those one level Hexblade dips that really muddy the game for you, but you still want to keep all of the Hexblade's features intact, then I would really recommend this homebrew rule. For our games at Short Rest, we have taken the second part of the Hex Warrior feature and moved it to the Pact of the Blade. Now this gives the Pact of the Blade a little bit of extra fluff, but I think it's well needed because the Pact of the Tome is actually pretty awesome and Pact of the Chain is really hit or miss, but giving that charisma to attack and damage rolls to Pact of the Blade means that you need to take a three level dip instead of a one into Warlock to get that charisma to attack and damage rolls. Additionally, this means that the Hexblade isn't the only viable Warlock Gish subclass. Now you can have an Archfey patron who is dealing attack and damage rolls with their Charisma modifier. Though they don't get that medium armor and shield and martial weapon proficiency that the Hexblade natively gets. That's something to remember that that First part, which gives those proficiencies, it remains as part of the Hexblade features to keep them feeling a little bit special and the best Warlock Gish subclass. Overall, I really, really love this subclass. It's exactly what I look for in D&D. I love the Warlock as a class in general. The Spell Sword Fantasy is my absolute favorite type of fantasy in Dungeons and Dragons, and it's a really, really solid subclass. Even if you don't think it's overpowered, it can really stand its own and have a seat at the table. And for that reason, if I were to rank this subclass out of five, I would give the Hexblade Warlock a five out of five. What do you think? I really love this subclass and I would love to chat about it in the comments down below, even if you just want to share your different Hexblade builds or opinions on the subclass. Before I leave, I just want to thank our patrons for June. That's Faison Ahmad, Painted Sky, and Robert Allen Klaus III. Thank you guys so much for supporting us on Patreon. Your support really does mean the world to us. And if you're watching and you want to add value to the channel yourself, you can follow the Patreon link in the description down below. We have a couple of benefits there, including an exclusive Long Rest podcast. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and we hope to see you on your next short rest.